Welcome back to The Debrief. We're back talking about Salt Lake City again. Uh, it's one of those rare instances where one city holds events two weekends back to back and couldn't ask for better people to talk to. I, my name's Tyler Norton from Plastic Weekly, joined as always by John Bergman, uh, roving competition journalist and the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. And we are graced today. Our special guest for uh, this weekend is Megan Martin, who was doing commentary uh, with Pete woods of course for both weekends and is also the first women's champion of american ninja warrior uh so I, we're graced by we're graced by competition royalty of many different sports uh thanks so much megan for uh, for coming back it's second time on the show but we're actually talking about a comp this time rather than just cornering you about questions about yourself so that's got to be a nice change yeah, I'm way more excited to talk about competitions as opposed to myself. <laughs> awesome. So you're both back uh, at home, uh, you know, flights, all that stuff are over. Everybody's back in their comfort zone. I'm sure it was a, a, a long week for both of you. Um, it, it, just to kind of wrap up now that the event is over and, and they're tearing down the wall and the holds are getting packed up and everything. Do you guys just have some reflections on just the how it felt being out there, the crowd, the atmosphere? Um, did it feel like people thought it was a safe environment? Like just what was the overall vibe when you spent that week in Salt Lake City? I, I feel like the overall vibe was excitement, especially having a crowd because so many of the athletes hadn't competed in front of a crowd in a very long time. So I think that just the way that that was able to happen and I, I generally felt like people seemed like they felt safe. I mean, I felt safe the whole time. I'm also vaccinated though. So I feel like <laughs> I'm going to feel pretty safe. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was one thing when I interviewed Adam after he won the first weekend, he was so psyched to have the crowd. And yeah, I think it was just a happy, exciting time that felt a little more normal for everyone. I agree. It, w it was the, the phrase that kept coming up when I would talk to people was that it felt like a family reunion in a lot of ways. Um, and that's not limited to people that are members of the media or, you know, the athletes or whatever. I think the just kind of the fans felt that way, too, just seeing the athletes in person, um, being part of a crowd. It really just felt like you were kind of going back to your family. Uh, I mean, it was just, you know, it was incredible. I, I kept kind of trying to imagine the big moments of this competition what they would have been like and how they would have been a lot worse if there had been no crowd there. Um, that would have just been such a dud, especially since so many of the big moments were, as we'll talk about from American competitors to have the American crowd there was just kind of uh, extra special. And it, it just would have been awful if, if there was no crowd there. Um, you know? So uh, yeah, I agree with everything Megan said. It was just, it was awesome. I think, you know, from from the online side, after having watched Maringen where there was, you know, there was it was just really athletes and coaches in the building, but there was still enough of an applause that, you know, it, it didn't feel it didn't feel like that Austrian series of events. Right. Like those mm -hmm. felt so sterile and, and not not blaming them. It was like a brutal condition. But, you know. Maringen wasn't too bad, but this, you really felt it in the winning moments was when it knocked you off your feet. Cause yeah, you've got a crowd hanging out and, and applauding tops, but especially in those moments with the Americans where it was a crowd at its like greatest, the loudest crowd you can get. That's when you, you really miss what we've been missing for, uh, for a couple of years. So yeah, it was, uh, it was nice to see everybody back. Lots of like, I mean, lots of comments on you know, mask wearing and all that stuff. And, and everybody has an opinion, whatever, but from, <laughs> at least from a spectator side, it was a, uh, it was a great experience, um, all around. Uh, Megan, I wanted to ask you how you found commentating, uh, for, for an IFSC event compared to the, uh, US and, uh, you know, combined with ESPN, like, w did you notice any big differences? Um, so this is my second IFSC event I've commentated yet. This was the biggest one because the first one was Pan Am. So, mm. It's a little different. You have fewer athletes. Um, yeah, there are some differences here and there. I mean, they, I mean, each production has their own way of doing things. But I was lucky enough to have already worked with IFSC, so I kind of knew how the flow was going to go um, ahead of time. And so, yeah, I mean, overall, I thought it was great. Um, can I get my dog really quick? I'm so yeah, sorry. Go for it. I can okay. jump back into that. So we'll do, a, we'll do a segment of John and Tyler small talk. Yeah. So, John, how do you, looking at the wall behind you, how do you feel about points-based bouldering scoring systems? 
<laughs> oh, that's a that's a that's a whole podcast oh, in and of itself. And that's the end of our and that's the end of our segment. Easier. Thanks so much, Sean, for your uh, <laughs> for your uh, for your conversation. Uh, Welcome back, Megan. Uh, uh, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. It's all um, right. Yeah, I think that you know, there's different graphics with each. That's one. That's one way in which they're like a little different. Um, so just kind of refamiliarizing myself with like subtle differences like that, and making sure I'm talking about the right things, explaining the right things. Lucky, luckily now when I commentate a U.S. event, it's the same scoring and rules as IFSC, so I don't have to do that whole thing. But I remember when I did Pan Ams, I did have to make sure I refamiliarized myself with the rules because we were using a different scoring system before, so that makes that easier, just being on the same mm-hmm. <laughs> page with that. Um, but yeah, I thought it went great. And also, actually, this is the first time I've commentated outside. Now, that was a little different, I will say, because when I did Pan Ams, I was inside. And one of the biggest things was just it's hard to have the screen not have a glare when you're outside. So that was that was one thing. Um, but, I mean, it's not terrible. It's just, like, a fact of being outside is sometimes you're going to end up doing this a little bit, like, as you're looking at the screen trying to right. figure out <laughs> how, to, how you can see everything. Uh, whereas when you're inside, it's so easy to not have a glare. Yeah, it was the same thing for the athletes too, in terms of outside and the glare. Particularly, uh, I think it was the fourth boulder in the finals when they were standing in the kind of the doorway or whatever, ready to run out for their turn for their attempt. You could see them whenever they would step into that doorway spot, they were just like, "Ah, oh, God!" You know, they, like, <laughs> yeah, they could. They the sun really hit them, so that was something that the athletes you know, probably weren't used to as well to a, to a certain extent. I wanted to ask Megan, um, is it still the same kind of idea where, you know, it's sort of the one difference I was going to mention between like kind of American events and international events is you run into like a lot of names that are not familiar in North America, right? Yeah. Um, and is it still the same kind of thing where if you want to learn how to pronounce it, you have to go to the athlete or go to the coach? Or did you have a better resource this time? No, that's basically what I did. <laughs> okay. I actually, before semis, I went down and sat at ISO check-in and when everyone went to turn in their phones, I quickly said, Hey, I'm doing the live stream. I just want to make sure I'm saying your name properly. Can you say it for me? And you know, it's funny cause some athletes actually don't really care. Mm-hmm. And so I repeated a couple of times. They're like, Oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. And I'm, I hope it's fine. Mm-hmm. But some like, I remember Orion was like, I don't really care. It's fine though. Whatever you do. And I was like, but I care. I really <laughs> care. I want to make sure I say it right. And then it was also interesting because when I asked Futaba, she referred to Akio really quick on how she should tell me to say her name, which I thought was cool and interesting. And then it made me think, too, that, like, I probably just will never be able to say it properly, but I'll just try mm-hmm. as hard as I can to say it, you know, because I think there is because of the language difference. I think, like, they 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 probably know that we can't ever get the accent 100 percent right. So as long as I can get close enough, I think that's good. But, yeah, it is different. There's a lot of different. Well, and. I was surprised, too, because you think sometimes, oh, I think I know how to say this person's name because I've heard so many other people say it. But then, <laughs> for example, Hannah Moyle, mm-hmm. Moyle, not Mule, Moyle. Yeah. And I was like, oh, well, hmm. I'm so glad. Or I remember before, um, I think Speed, we were running through the list and Pete and I were like, oh, Laura Stockler, Stokler, maybe. I don't know. And then when I asked Kata, she said, no, it's Steckler. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, see, I'm so glad I asked. So, yeah. Hmm. I usually have to run around trying to figure out how to say the names. Nobody really, you know, it would be cool if we had just like phonetic uh, spellings of everyone's names that we could go through ahead of time, but maybe one day, but I don't mind. Yeah. I was talking with uh, (laughs) with a a guy last night who, who, it's like his his hobby seems to be just like you know what info does the IFSC keep in their database he just likes knowing what they track um and one thing i i would really love to have is just like an audio file of of them just name saying their own names right like yeah. it's it's uh because like like you mentioned yeah, you, you it, often yeah, go off of athlete Yeah, you Mm -hmm. often go off of, and I mean, yeah, exactly what you were just saying is, you know, when they show that bio card where it shows their face, and this is, I'm, I'm reaching out to that Key and Peele sketch where they do all the, the fictional university football athletes and they all say their name, but like something like that would, like, first of all, it would shut up the YouTube live chat who insists they know how to pronounce people's names. Like, yeah, I was going to say, Megan, yeah, yeah, Megan, you're not doing it for you or the athletes. Really, you're doing it for the YouTube chat who just will not shut up about name pronunciation. 
pronunciations. Um, but uh, yeah, something like that. Keep, like, because, you know, so often you just have to go off of like, what did previous commentators mm -hmm. say? And there's nothing yeah. to say that, you know, Charlie or Matt or whoever said it correctly. So yeah, mm -hmm. tough one. It's also difficult to even ask the question, right? And I think part of like why Futaba referred to Akio is because Akio speaks English better, right? And mm -hmm. so she's like, probably catching parts of what I'm asking her, but not 100% sure. So she's going to defer to her athlete or her um, fellow um, teammate who might speak better English. And that's that's when sometimes I pulled the coaches over, right? Like right. I definitely, a few of Luca's Slovenian athletes were in ISO, but a few of them weren't. And then he walked by and I was like, wait, Luca, come over here, please. Can you Can you run me through these names really quick? And, you know, he speaks like five languages, so... It's easy for him to sit there and tell me how to say Andre Perhartz like 15 times right. before I get it right. <laughs> that, that, I was going to ask you about that one because like yeah, for Perhartz is I whenever Andre says it, he doesn't like, I feel like we add a T to the end, like Perhartz kind of, yeah. but he says it like it's just an S like Perhartz. And yeah. I, I've been trying to figure that one out, but it's, yeah, yeah, that's another great name that's just, you know, caused a lot of confusion. We spent like at least five minutes on there, yeah. on him specifically. <laughs> I was like at the table, I was like, wait, am I doing it right? right. Luke, Luke is such a good sport, so thankful he was there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Megan, one thing I wanted to ask you related to not so much commentary, but event emceeing, which is, you know, speaking of pronunciation, from your experience when you were competing at, at you know, high-end events and whatnot, uh, do, do you, when you are in the midst of your attempts and whatnot on the wall, do you hear, does it register what the MC is saying or are you just so much in the zone that you don't, don't hear it? Not, not generally when you're not, definitely not on the wall. Um, I feel like I hear noises on the wall, but that's about it. Um, I remember I flashed a boulder and veil in 2017, I think. And I remember when I topped it, I remember the MC at the time was like, she looks surprised, but she shouldn't be. And I just like, that was, it was funny that I heard him say that. Um, but yeah, not when you're so focused, maybe like as you're walking onto the mats or when you finish a boulder or something, but yeah, I couldn't, I probably could only tell you a few times that I remembered specific things that an MC has said, because you're just so focused. Yeah. You're I always really wondered if, attention. <laughs> yeah. When the MC, if the MC mispronounces your name, when you're running out there, I wonder if any athletes like darn them, you know, or uh, they're just highly them, so. unlikely. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of honestly, especially when there's lots of people, you're trying to make sure, am I in the right position in line to get to the right boulder that I'm going to? Like, am I in front of the right boulder? Who do I give the judge my name tag or my scorecard to for the judge? So it's more of that kind of stuff. So it'd be impressive if you can multitask enough to hear a mispronounced word or name. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's let's start talking about the comp, and we always start off with headlines. Uh, John, I'm going to give this one to you to start off. What is what is the the big New York Times banner headline for uh, for this weekend in Salt Lake? Okay, I thought a lot about this, and there are several that we could equally choose. I'm sure we will get into all of them, but I might kind of surprise both of you or the people listening with this headline. My headline, the thing that that I'm just so moved by, would be Sean Bailey finds redemption. And, and here's why I chose that. Um, let's go back to the Pan Ams that we were just talking about. 2000, early 2020, right? Sean Bailey is winning. He's in first place after qualification. And I think a lot of people expected him to be the one that would get the Olympic berth, right? I mean, I know that if I would have had to sort of make a prediction at that point, I probably would have had to predict Sean Bailey being being the person. Um, he doesn't end up getting the Olympic berth. He doesn't win at Pan Ams. He had to be just crushed by that. I don't know. I don't want to put words in his, you know, I, I didn't speak to him, but I'm sure he was sad. I was sad. And I know a lot of fans were sad. Now, this is to take nothing away from Colin Duffy, of course. That's like a whole different discussion. We all love Colin Duffy. But, um, you know, we were sad for Sean. And I would imagine after that, after that loss, because he had been on the circuit for so many years, he probably really wondered whether he even wanted to continue competing on the comp circuit, right? Because in this country, I think we can all admit that a lot of the whatever you want to say, cachet or sponsorship or, or money is in 
kind of these glorified outdoor sins, right? It's it's not yet in it's it's very hard to make a full time career on the comp scene, if not impossible. Um, and so Sean Bailey, after the Pan Ams, could have just easily left the comp scene and and gone and done outdoor amazing outdoor things, which he's already done in the past. And we all know that he's capable of doing the hardest routes, whatever the hardest benchmark is outdoors, 515C, 515D. I think Sean Bailey is is you know he has the the pedigree to to achieve that. But he he didn't. He made the choice to continue on the competition scene. He made the choice to keep competing, to come back to the World Cup circuit again when he he totally didn't have to. And I think that that shows a lot of courage on his part. I think that shows a lot of character um, on his part. And frankly, I think that's a rare commodity. And and he should be celebrated for those of us tyler you me megan for those of us who love the comp circuit and who want the comp circuit to be the biggest thing he chose the comp he chose the comp circuit over this potential you know outdoor career path and that deserves so much celebration and i think that his victory here um just kind of proves that it was all worth it and i think it was just kind of a in a way, it was sort of like a, I don't know, it was just, um, it's like he was thanking the fans, I guess, for supporting him, and we were thanking him for continuing on the circuit. Um, so for me, his victory here, and particularly his his top of men's four in the finals, what a moment. Um, the narrative that underpins it with him coming back after the Pan Ams and everything, it just doesn't get any better, in my opinion. So you're that's gonna make why me that, cry, John. Uh, we should add some like rousing violin music behind that. Seriously. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'll I'll pop in briefly with an uninformed opinion, and then Megan can can say if I'm wrong or not. But I've I've spoken in the past about how Sean is kind of an underwhelming competitor to me sometimes, because I just from the image he puts across um, in competitions, it feels like sometimes I'm not totally sure he wants to be there. Um, and again, I don't know the guy. Uh, so this this is just like what I kind of perceive from from how he behaves at events um, and how he reacts to um, uh, to uh, to his results. But his Instagram post was was really endearing um, and kind of kind of talked a little bit about what, what you mentioned, John, where there it takes a lot of courage to to uh, to go. I, I'm going to absolutely botch what he wrote. But basically, you know, it's not a dream if it's if it's hard to reach. Uh, read, read, read the, the good part. I don't know what part it is. John, did you just mute yourself? <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Hello? Okay. Um, so I have it here and, and he, so he's writing, he says it's a message to himself. Mm. He says, there's nothing scarier than fighting for your dreams because nothing hurts more than failing at them. And you will over and over again. They aren't dreams if they aren't out of reach. I think that's a, that's a really good sentiment. But the beautiful thing is every one of those failures, every one of those times you doubt yourself, that's the victory you feel at the top of the wall. And there's no victory like victory over yourself. So yeah, that's, that's, that's such a, I, that's, yeah, I, I can't ask for a better, in, like who cares about judging I'm people's Instagram that posts. Up. <laughs> but yeah, what a great, what a great post. And, and like it, I, I'm, I'm very happy for, for his win and it, it kind of, I still have to, you know, see how he goes uh, on in the future. But like we've known he's a really strong climber and I've always wondered if he's committed or not. Um, and it was a kind of a weird round of boulders, but I'm really happy for the guy. Um, I think uh, especially after coming fairly close in Vail, um, I'm I'm excited to, you know, to see how the next couple of events go. But yeah, it's interesting, too, that you bring up that idea of whether or not he wants to be out there. I feel like. I feel like that really just comes from him being hard on himself and frustrated when things aren't going well in a round because uh, cause he is pretty hard on himself because he does care a lot. And he also knows that he is capable, right? And, I mean, Vale, when he plays second, that was his first time ever even making semifinals mm -hmm. in a World Cup. Um, and then he made finals and then he was on the podium. So it's like... It's just so much has to click in order for the right things to happen. And also, you see this a lot with athletes. They make a final 
Um, and before that, maybe they weren't even consistent in semifinals. And then eventually they start becoming very consistent in semifinals because there is that confidence aspect that's really important to like know that you can do this, right? Like you already kind of know because you know you're talented, whatever. But then it's just further um, like concrete. Uh, what's the word? I don't know why I'm reading the word. Uh, you're just building a foundation for yeah. yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're further finding out that you did like that you can be there that you can compete with the best and I feel like that was really important for Sean to play second a couple years ago and it's nice to see that this season specifically he's really putting it together by being consistent in semis and like placing like well in semis if he's not in the final and then ending up with a win and having made the final and even even bringing him back up that 2019 season like he did seem like he was going to win at Pan Ams and he only missed out by one spot in Toulouse so he had a really rough um, ending to that Olympic goal. And I remember talking to him right after in Pan Ams. And it was almost like we didn't say very many words, honestly, because it was just tough. And I was like, dude, man, like that, that's really all I can really say. And like give him a hug and, you know, want to buy him a beer because like that was that was not the way he wanted to end his, you know, strive of the dream of the Olympics. So it's nice to see him come back. And yeah, I think there were questions on whether or not he'd focus more on outdoor again, or even come back for another season. So I was so happy to see him at team trials. I didn't know he was going to come to team trials. I was like, is he even going to show up? I have no idea. And then he was there and then that didn't go so well for him in bouldering, but he still was able to go to Myringen and then Salt Lakes. So it's, it's awesome to see him make that decision. I think it's really important for competitions climbing in general, right. To show how important it can be and, how big of a deal it is. I think you hit the nail on the head because nobody would have, I think, been surprised or questioned it if after the Pan Ams he had walked away. Because, it, but, but at the same time, like you said, Megan, nobody wanted that to be the ending of his competition career, right? Because he's, I mean, he's, you know, a, a national champion and, and he's had so much uh, that he's given to the circuit long before the Olympics was, was a thing. So nobody wanted it to end that way, but nobody would have been surprised if it, if it had ended that way for him. And he just wanted to be done with comps. And so it's just the fact that he came back to, to I think, a lot of people's surprise. That's just all part of this win. That's It's all woven into that top of men's number four um, here at, at Salt Lake, which is just why I think it's it was just such a, frankly, such a beautiful moment for, for the sport, for the history of American comp climbing, for all of that. I definitely cried. <laughs> it was awesome. It was so cool. Also, what's really cool, and we might get to this later, but though the round was tough for the men, I mean, Sean actually got close to doing the other two boulders too. Mm -hmm. How do you have like one more minute on each? I mean, he was doing the proper beta on that slab boulder. He was so close to sticking the jump on the far right boulder, which I can't, like, I should mm -hmm. remember, but I think it was the first boulder. I don't know. Uh, second, second boulder, one, second yeah. boulder. So second and third boulder, yeah. So even though those didn't get done, he was really close to doing the moves he needed to do to make it happen. Yeah. So Megan, I got to ask you for, for your headline for uh, for this event. And I feel it might be a little bit different, but yeah. Let's, Mine's let's a little it. more basic and I feel like it won't be as eloquent as. <laughs> you don't have to. I didn't expect John to, John to like, I, I needed an okay. American flag to drop behind John and then the band comes out. <laughs> I'm telling you that Sean Bailey, that, that really meant a lot to me. That, that, awesome. uh, that, right. you know, that moment. So. So my headline would be Frederick Leonardo breaks the world record and wins the speed world cup in the last race of the night. I mean, usually when we see records put up, they're not in the final race. Uh, so I think that that was so exciting. Also just thinking to how all of his races went that day, each one was faster and faster and faster. And in my opinion, I'm sitting there commentating it and I'm thinking, I don't know, even though they, he kept getting faster, I still thought Kiramal was going to pull it off in the end again. And then Bedrick just kind of like took off from the start. And I, there was just so excite much excitement to see him break that record. Um, and by so, I mean, the first record of the day took that record so much <laughs> faster than it had. And it had been up since 2017. So it's like the speed climbing portion of the weekend was just so exciting. Um, and just shows that we can, we're, we're going to see so much more from the Indonesian athletes specifically. And their goal is 2024. They didn't really get to try for 2020 slash 2021. Um, so I just thought that was overall so exciting. 
it was one of the rare moments where the hype it, it kind of lives up to the hype because Tyler, I don't know if this came through on the live on the live stream, but but prior to this the that event, like there was just like a buzz in the crowd. People were like, "Oh, the world record might get broken. The world record might." And that that is always like a surefire way to make sure that it's going to be a dud and nothing <laughs> like you know, and the the potential world record winner is gonna like false start or something. Like it just and and so the whole time I was like nervous that there was so much anticipation <laughs> as much as it was fun to chat about it. You're just kind of like, uh, I don't know if we should start talking about world records, maybe getting broken. Uh, and yet it, it did like that never happens. You know? And they so. were just so consistent the whole time. Cause you're right. The vibe, the whole week leading up, it's like, Oh, they've broken the record multiple times at momentum. Oh, which was, everyone was like, okay, well that's cool, but it's not a certified wall. So do we really like, how can we tell? And then they do the practice and everyone's complaining about how slippery the wall is, but yet both Kiramal and Bedrick are breaking the record in practice. So there's this idea that it's going to happen. And then for it to happen in the very first run, I feel like there was that sigh of relief, like, okay, at least it happened. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't jinx it by talking I, about it all week. It, right. uh, you, you bring up a good point. It's like, it was, uh, there was so much hype. It felt like it could only be a disappointment. Like Albert Oak has been in my Instagram DMs for yeah. months saying that like, this is like, they're going to break five seconds, like all this, all this shit. And all, all I could say was like, it's cool that these people do some fast runs and share them on Instagram, but like anybody could just post their best runs. So mm -hmm. like, let's see it. And so it was, I, as much as I was like, part of me wanted just because I find it so funny when Albert overhypes something and then it doesn't work <laughs> out. I was actually really happy to see the very first race of the day and uh, like in qualifiers and uh, uh, Kiramal just like knocks it out of the park and you're just like, oh shit, this is, this could be real. It's a so, real thing. Yeah. There was uh yeah. And how, like, I mean, they put up, what was it? A total of five times that were something like that below the previous world record. Yeah, um, something but, like that. Yeah. Five Mine or seven four, or something yeah. like that. Possibly. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I'm counting practice or not, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, it was, I was so happy. I was really hoping for uh, a Polish one, two, three on the women's side and an Indonesian mm -hmm. one, two on the men's side. So I was just really happy to see, you know, the two Indonesian climbers who, you know, have been in this together apparently for, for a while, get to race each other and just probably, a race they've done a million times before and and you could just tell that both of them were so happy to be there and of course Kiramal was excited for his compatriots like you know record as well that was that was a really perfect ending to the to the men's side so the great yeah great great event all around the it lived up to the hype it's a great way to put it for sure great way to put it <laughs> um yeah so since you got like i we have a whole winners segment coming up so i don't feel bad skipping the other obvious winners that that will will come up in the next one so i'm gonna throw out here this i just thought this was so stunning not just this weekend but kind of the leftovers from last weekend so i i we're all like approximately the same age ish so i'm wondering if you guys had these as kids but we know that like the berenstain bears that mm -hmm. like series sure. of kids books so a common berenstain bears trope is a title will be like the berenstain bears and too much junk food or the berenstain bears <laughs> and too much birthday or like too many strangers or whatever so that that like that's just something that's always lived in my head and so my headline for this week is pro climbers and too much utah um <laughs> it the number of injuries to f kind of important climbers and then that whole covid mess up it was mm. just like everybody went and maybe had too much of a good time climbing great rock and being yeah. back on the comp circuit and standing a little too close to each other or whatever like the casualties list is so <laughs> some some of these are like less related than others but so andre bales on the second event due to a tweak in his shoulder Miho Tanaka, after this weekend's finals, comes out with an ice pack on her shoulder. Julia Shannardy didn't even climb in the first weekend because of supposed shoulder problems. Shauna Coxie goes home as she planned after the first yeah. one, but having like, I shouldn't say back issues, but she is aware that her back is still causing some problems for her. Um, Jesse Pills uh, pops a pulley, which like rest in peace. That is brutal to happen at this time oh, in the bad. game for an olympian zach gala 
half hero, half kind of being dumb. I don't know how you guys feel about him climbing for that long in finals with like, it, at least from the I camera have some shots. Notes on that. Okay. Yeah. I'll hear him in a second. And then of course, uh, Niels Favre from the uh, Swiss team, apparently testing positive for COVID, which in collateral took out Sasha Lehman, Yerne Kruder and Serge Tepishko, uh just due to proximity. Like that's a, that's a lot of big names. Um, leaving the event kind of like for worse um, than uh, than when they got there. And I was kind of stunned and kind of curious what thoughts you had. So Megan, uh, before we go, I'll, I'll ask you what you have to about uh, Zach Gala because he didn't post anything about it really. Yeah, so I was like freaking out during the live stream. I like even hit the talk back and I was like, can we find out what's going on with Zach? Because I, I thought it was the shoulder, like his arm where he had labrum surgery on like not too long ago. So I was like getting all nervous. Uh, that he was, you know, making bad decisions and possibly putting himself in a precarious situation with his arms. And when I saw him after, I was like, I was like, is your arm okay? What's going on with it? Because that's your shoulder, right? And he was like, yeah, it actually was just like a cramp. And I was like, oh, like maybe you were dehydrated or something. He was like, yeah, man, I don't know. It was so weird. I was like, okay, phew, because I wasn't sure. I mean, you weren't grabbing your shoulder, but, you know, things are all connected. I'm not a doctor, so I was all worried. But, yeah, he said it was just like a cramp. So. It looked so it bad sense. on the stream. Like, I know. That's it, like, it almost looked like it would drop, too. And I was like, what is going on? It, he, so so it was kind of like his like bicep-ish area. And it seemed like he was trying to like roll it out on his chest. And he would come down from an attempt and like have like a pained look on his face. Like, John, I don't know if it came across in the audience, but it looked so bad on the stream. It was like, you have to stop climbing now, buddy. <laughs> uh, so I'm glad it's not that serious, but it, it yeah. did look pretty, uh, pretty rough on the stream. But um, yeah, have you guys heard anything? Just, you know, how, how athletes are, are dealing or co or just if you have thoughts on, on how many kind of like casualties there were. Uh, you know, it's interesting because I actually kind of have a different take. I think that th there's a, a, a positive to take away from, from all that, which is, I think the, whatever protocols the IFSC had in place for USA and USA climbing um, for a positive COVID te COVID case, uh, it, it worked. Right. And I'm not, I understand that there's some anger from certain athletes that had to be quarantined and all that. Um, so I'm not making a judgment on, on sort of their frustrations there. Uh, but I'm just saying, take back, you know, let's go back a year ago or, or something. And if you had had a comp like this, it's very likely uh, that, that, you know, every athlete then could have tested positive, right? Like it, it but there was a, a, a really good system in place for an athlete test positive. You quarantine that athlete, you, you do contact tracing. Um, and, and to, as of right now, from what I've heard there, there only ended up being one positive, that one positive case. Um, so I actually think the, the COVID stuff is, is sort of a, I, I think it actually was handled, um, really well, if, if the ultimate goal is to stop it from spreading throughout the entire roster and the audience and got, you know, who, who knows how, you know, how bad it could have gone. Now, of course, a lot of that is because many people are presumably vaccinated, uh, many of the athletes and whatnot. But, um, but it's interesting, Tyler, when you, when you mentioned the COVID thing, I actually think that was a, how it was handled was, was overall, the, the proof is, it, it was good. The proof is that there's, that there was only that one positive case. So. Well, I guess the, the the thing about COVID, I mean, is I'm talking about like climbers, like, you know, they just kind of got wrecked by the event. And the COVID part in particular is about, I don't know which of those athletes are vaccinated. Um, I'm assuming some of them are and some of them aren't, but maybe none of them are. Um, but at like, given that the rule book has been updated with COVID guidance and the info sheet published to all the teams and available on the website for the last couple months clearly says what happens if you're near somebody that tests positive, right? Like this was this shouldn't have been a surprise. Like why are you why are you getting in a car with other people and go like I understand that athletes are young and they feel invincible and whatever. Um, but like th these feel like basic protections you could have taken and say, Hey, like, this is an important thing. You know what happens if this, you know, if this goes wrong, you don't even have to, you don't even have to catch COVID to be forced out of the competition. Right. And so that's the part that was disappointing is it seemed like everybody just went back to their old way of we're back on the world cup circuit. We climb when we have a day off and we all hang out. And it was just like, we're not quite there yet, guys. And the rule yeah. book is like pretty clear, but well, and from my understanding, they were just following what the CDC guidelines are anyway, right? And it's like, if you were by somebody and and then if you're not vaccinated and like 
for example, like Petra is vaccinated because a lot of the Olympic qualified athletes are vaccinated, but in Europe and Canada, like it's been harder to get vaccines. So a lot of these other athletes that aren't going to the Olympics aren't vaccinated yet. Mm -hmm. So it made it. And if you are someone that's not vaccinated, you would think, well, maybe I'm going to be even more careful because in reality with that mixed gender comp that happened, like a lot of those athletes were still around each other in that capacity, but luckily it wasn't enough time or like some of them were vaccinated, so they still got to compete and whatnot. Cause like that alone could have created sure. even more of a disaster. Mm-hmm. And and we were lucky that it didn't happen in only four athletes. I mean, obviously we'd want to see, or sorry, three athletes um, didn't mm-hmm. get to compete due to the COVID, but um, it could have been even worse than that. Like you were saying, John, like, yeah. and especially having held that comp in the middle of the two competitions, which mm-hmm. is another thing to even talk about too, right? Like a lot of the athletes competed three times that week, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm glad wild. you mentioned that. I, I didn't even, I, when I was doing my notes for this, I like totally forgot about that event, but I thought that was a great event. And from talking to the athletes, they all really loved it. Loved I think there's it. a lot of potential there for, for IFSC doing something similar at future World Cups, I, I I think it was a huge success in that sense. Were either of you guys in the uh, in the building for that? So you weren't allowed in the building. You were okay. sitting outside in chairs, um, watching it on the screen. And then there was a huge like um, separator between the people in the chairs watching, and then the people in the chairs that were the athletes competing on the boulders. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. It, uh, so they, they, the IFSC put up like an Instagram stream because when they, mm-hmm. the IFSC posted that thing saying, Hey, we're going to do a new event. It's going to be super cool, but there was no stream for it. So everybody was like, you know, where can we see this? So it was nice of them to put up a stream, but it doesn't have commentary and commentary, especially for a format that nobody's ever seen before, like would have been yeah. helpful. I don't blame anybody because they didn't plan on running a stream in the first place, but it proved that there was a lot of curiosity for it. And I think after a lot of athletes have had their perception of speed climbing change so much after after just trying it um, due to the Olympics, I think people are more open to different formats. But we were talking in the in the Plastic Weekly Discord, and I think there is a lot of interest in like, what would a team kind of event look like? I think some people were skeptical about using the coaches to make decisions. Like I'm, I like sports where athletes have to make decisions and that becomes a part of your skill set. But I think there's, there's room in there. Um, I think all those little components on their own, like coach involvement is extremely interesting. Um, you know, uh, team dynamic is extremely interesting depending on what settings you use. So I'm glad they tried it. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to talk to somebody in the future and maybe they have some insight on how that all worked out. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was cool that they, uh, that they ran that. I'm glad you said the athletes liked it. Cause I, I didn't hear much feedback on that side. So yeah. Oh yeah. Cool. They loved it. Everyone was so psyched. They were like, Oh, it felt like a session. I had so much fun. <laughs> the boulders were fun and they were hard boulders too. I thought yeah. that like, cause I actually foreran those boulders and then I went and foreran some of women's semis after. And I remember the mantle that they had in the mixed gender comp, I was like, whew, that's way harder than like anything that's been out right. here on this wall. Wait, I so mean, hold on. They didn't were you that openly? Were you people, a World but... Cup forerunner as well as I? As... I did get the World Cup forerun a little bit as well. That's a huge. <laughs> so tell 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 me about yeah. that. We're going off. We're going off script here, but like, tell tell me yeah. a bit about that. Like, you know, what's what was it? so it was Jamie. Ca- were you working with the root setters? So I guess Jamie Cassidy yeah. from Great Britain was the head setter. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you yeah. forerun for both weeks? I didn't know not for the first week because I got week? there on Friday during I got there okay. right in time for men's qualies. Okay. Um, but I, I I didn't really like expect to get to like I forewent a lot for our, all of the USA climbing nationals. That's literally the only time I have a chance to climb. So I usually, <laughs> especially when we're in a venue that's like far from gyms, I'm like, okay, well this is it. This is great. Plus it's I mean obviously as a former competitor you're definitely psyched to get together on the boulders yeah. like that's all you want to do anyway so i walked out there um to you know say hi to everybody and i saw women's semi three mm-hmm. and i was like and i had already foreran the mixed gender comp and climbed for like two hours before that so i was like already pretty tired but i was like you know what that one looks fun can i try it yeah. <laughs> and they were like sure Right. So I like put my shoes on and started four running. So I got on like women's three and four. Um, and then after they let me do that, I was like, well, no, I definitely want to four run for quality specifically. <laughs> um, I, I would have wanted to four run for finals too, but I walked out there the next day and I was so wrecked from the day before. Sure. I was like, okay, see you guys later. Have fun. Yeah. But then came out for qualies and got on um, 
like four of the five qualities. I basically just where they need help. Right. Right. Um, because one of the boulders had been like done for a while, but they were still tweaking a bunch of them. So I was just kind of like running back and forth in between boulders, trying to like, you know, so offer can, any help. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little bit? So just to get the roster. So Jamie Cassidy was chiefing. And then I think second week was Garrett <laughs> Gregor and Flannery. So, or... so Jamie chiefed both weekends. Yeah. 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 Which was, I'm for my understanding was that wasn't what the plan was. No, there was right. supposed to be a different chief that couldn't get into right. the country. That's what I heard. Um, and so, so the second week was Jamie and then Jan Janou from, I don't know if I'm saying his last name right, but from France, mm-hmm. uh, or he's French, but he lives in England. And then Garrett Greger was setting and Flannery Shane Nemero. And then those were all the IFSC official setters. And mm-hmm. then you had Dave Wetmore, Ian McIntosh, and Ryan Sewell also okay. on that second weekend crew. Um, so a lot of setters. Yeah. Was, so right? what was the process like? Like if, was it just like some of the setters would call you over to a problem? Were you trying the entire thing or like how, how, how did that process uh, work? It varies. Um, oftentimes I would try things from start to finish or say, try something a specific way that just to make sure if it is possible, it's still hard. Um, really good example is women's number three I think in qualifiers that stand-up one um I think it was three it might have been four I they had me try to go out on the feet first and then stand up which was like nasty I I, and I like got out there got my foot up and was like ew this is gross maybe someone could do it but I mean if they're gonna do it they'll have to work for it still so it's like that kind of thing it's right. okay if if someone does it a different way, as long as it's not like blatantly easier. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, when they would be, I mean, I, there was no order. I, I mean, like, and they weren't like specifically calling me and like, I was going out there, right. right? Like I wanted to get on the boulders and they were basically letting me. Um, <laughs> and then they were, I mean, they were psyched too to have, especially to have another woman on the boulders. But I mean, if I hadn't gone out there, I'm not sure if they would have called me or not. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, they would just have me try specific things or um, if they tweak something, then get on it. I remember women's three in semis, the one that only Brooke did. Mm-hmm. Um, originally, the, the volume was lower. Uh, and when I had already done the move, like placing my hip in there the way she did, but on the other side. Granted, they like told me to do that. I didn't figure that out myself. Okay. Um they had me get back up there again and see how high I could reach. And so then they ended up moving it up higher after. Hmm. Um, so little things like that. So it's just, it's a nice like way to gauge what people might do, but I always try to get on first start to bottom without any info. Cause that's a great gauge too, of like how I'm reading it. Um, and how the athletes might read it as well. Right. So, cause it's also hard to know, if you guys are setting, if they're setting the boulders, right. And they have the intended beta, like how is someone with no information going to approach it? Yeah. The, the one question I was curious about, and I, I've kind of like lost track of which problems are which, but there were instances yeah. where based on the, the beta that you and Pete had been told mm-hmm. about, or, or you had experienced, were there some moments where athletes succeeded on climbs where you were like, Oh, that didn't even come up. Like that was, you know, fresh that the roots that like you didn't hear the roots that are talking about you didn't try were there any like big surprises yeah I'm trying to if not Oof, don't worry about so it my memory gets wrecked for this stuff too it's all good um i mean i remember i think it was yoshiyuki on men's number one didn't go down with the palm the first time he like stepped on it i mean he ended up going to the palm beta later but like mm-hmm. And and again, like I, I wasn't in the conversation with the root setters. Right. They might have seen that happen. But there were I guess there were sometimes things that I didn't expect people to do. Um, but oftentimes when they would do oh, I remember this when I watched uh, Lara and like maybe a few other athletes grab the screw hole on that stand up hold instead mm-hmm. of the jib. I remember walking over to Flannery and being like, Oh, I can't believe we forgot to try <laughs> using the screw hole like I didn't think it, it didn't matter because they still ended up reverting back to the other beta anyway because it was just too gross. But that mm-hmm. was one time I was like, oh, we should have tried the screw hole. I forgot to think about that. <laughs> hmm. All right. okay. I, th- I think the, the big thing that I would guess was a kind of a, a sort of a beta break was on uh, men's one in the finals where I think it was intended to be that like paddle dino, the sort of like three. Mm-hmm. And, and yet 
Sean and I can't remember who the first competitor was. Kokoro Fuji, maybe. Um, yeah. They did it static. You know, they like did it sort of. They got to the first and then they stopped. And, and then that kind of that meat static. hook on the top of the first one, where like they got like positive purchase on that, and it just slowed them down and made them really stable. Mm-hmm. That was like such. Yeah, that was really exciting. Uh, them I think that. I think we didn't that see anybody the... do the, the the paddle. We I don't think we yeah. saw anybody do the intended the intended way. Well, I think the the issue with that was if they were going to go more with the paddle, like without kind of stalling in the middle, they really needed to throw their foot out. And a lot of the athletes who did, didn't necessarily fully throw their foot out at the end. And I think that was one of the reasons why it didn't right. really work. Um, but I'm pretty sure that other method that both Kokoro and Sean used was one of the methods that they intended right. as well. Okay, That's good. In, yeah. Good to know. Okay, let's go to uh, big winners. As far and, as I know. All right. <laughs> okay, big winners from the weekend. Megan, you are going. Uh, no, I'm going first. I have to remember. Like, who's, who, what's my order say here? Yeah, I'm going first with big winners. Um, okay, well, I get to pick one. You guys covered some stuff already. Uh, so, well, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop this one. Uh, it's Team USA slash. So John already picked Sean Bailey, and his story is legit. But I'm gonna say Natalia Grossman just because like she she's not she's only two years younger than Yanya Garnbrett she's been around for a few years not competing at like every single world cup but her form these last two weekends has been not something I would I know Americans have been talking about how she's you know probably the strongest boulder of the American team for a while we saw them say that at team trials um a lot of people having complaints that she wasn't on the Olympic team or whatever. But for me, watching her flash all four of these problems, as well as looking so excellent the weekend before, it started actually solidifying this reputation in my head. And, you know, I I, I don't know how to feel about all this because Yanya missed the first one. It comes to the, the second one and only narrowly misses out. But Natalia looked so good in finals specifically. Like just... Not, it, it looked like Yanya climbing, where it was just like, none of this bothers me. I've done it all before, and I've got something <laughs> to get to, so can we get this over with? Like, it looked that good. Um, I, I don't know even what to say about it, but it was like, you know, I'm, I'm so used to Yanya looking incredibly dominant. It was weird to see somebody else look as convincing as her, right? Mm-hmm. Because other people can win a World Cup, but you look at it and you're like, you know, they had to work for that. Whereas sometimes Yanya's wins are like... It just looks so simple. So seeing somebody else make it look that simple was really stunning. And I, we were making lots of jokes about how it's, it's you know, the fix is in for the American athletes whenever they're on American soil. We were like making conspiracy theories about, the, you know, the hardest hold on women's two with those wooden boomerang things it was like mm. hidden behind a pole shadow when Natalia had to grab it. But then it was in full sun for everybody else. So we were like having a lot of fun with that. But anyway, she looked excellent. And I... I cannot wait to watch her at every other event she goes to because, you know, maybe this was an outlier in her form, but her form looked so incredible that give like, give me, give me Natalia Grossman versus Yanni Garnbrett. Like every time, like you, yeah. if that's the, if that's a situation where you have two women now who can flash everything in a finals, the level has to go up now with the root setting. And that gets so exciting to me. Like I'm, yeah. Anyway, that was, that was amazing for me. I don't know how you guys felt about, uh, about her. No, I mean, I agree. It was absolutely amazing. She had a perfect day. I think at one point earlier in the live stream, I had said something about like, Oh, you're never really happy unless you flash every boulder and end up on the number one spot on the podium. And then <laughs> exactly what she did, uh, which was really awesome to see her have such an amazing day like that. But it is funny. Cause, um, I feel like people, a lot of people at least don't, or kind of think she came out of nowhere or that like this season is just like superb compared to others. But I, I mean, it really all kind of started in 2019. I mean, and then like obviously building ahead of time, but I mean, in 2019 in Vail, she was seventh. She was one spot out of finals. So she had already kind of started to like lay the groundwork there and then went to bouldering nationals and completely like walked everything. And I, I, mean, I can't remember it was so long ago now, but she could have, I know she did all the boulders and finals. She might've even flashed them all. I don't know, but she's had like a, you know, a lot of competition, like whether it's a mock comp or like a team trial event, like she's doing all the boulders and all the rounds a lot now. So she, that, that was something I think that prepared her to go out and flash all the boulders in that last round. Um, so she's just, 
kind of finding her flow, I feel like, and it's definitely evident and it was really cool to see her make that happen. And even the weekend before she didn't really struggle on any boulders until that jump boulder that she almost didn't do and then did it in the last like minute or so. Mm -hmm. Let's So. so you coached for team ABC while Brooke and Natalia were both on team ABC and you, you were coaching these two young women. So I, I kind of have to probe you on, on their (laughs) climbing. Like I, so Brooke is Brooke and Natalia both have seen this evolution in the last couple of years. And I'm just really curious to hear if like, cause so anyway, I, um, uh, I worked at a gym where there was this climber who was the same age as, uh, Brooke and Natalia. And so when we would go down to us nationals with him, he would often be climbing at the same time as the back then it was like the C boys and girls. Yeah. Right. And so I remember Maybe. that was like, you know, <laughs> team ABC had such a huge roster of C boys and girls at that time. And oh, yeah. you don't see a lot of the names anymore. Like they go on to life just yeah. like every other climbing program. Right. And so I, Brooke maybe has these extenuating circumstances of having a family tradition to uphold, but like Natalia's an interesting one um, that she's still in it. Just tell me a little bit about like, you know, why these two girls are still in it. And if they're the same young women that you worked with a bunch of years ago, like I I just need to know more about this, like their growth (laughs) to where they are now. Yeah. I mean, I think it's safe to say that both of them have always been pretty obsessed with climbing and love competition climbing and taking it really seriously, even when they were little. Um, Natalia is originally from Northern California and I forget the year she actually moved to Boulder, but honestly, I think it was before she was even in the B category. So her parents decided to move her from California to Boulder to train at ABC and to become, you know, the best she could be, Mm -hmm. uh, which I I think is a, was a great choice. That's a huge move for somebody that young. Uh, Like that's, that's, I started crying about it, talking about it on the live stream (laughs) the first weekend. Cause I mean, it's true. They, they had so much sacrifice that they had to, um, indoor in order to get her there. I mean, Boulder is a really expensive place to live. Um, they like moved their jobs, everything to support her and her dream to become the best that she could be. Uh, so dedication is something that they've both always had from the start and they're very different athletes in the way that they approach, but their dedication, I would say is the same. I would say that Natalia is a little more, regimented in terms of her training whereas Brooke has always been a little more um free with her training and then that's just a very different personality type um ironically they're like best friends so opposites definitely (laughs) attract in that respect uh, which I think was evident to everybody at the competition like how much they love each other which was so exciting to see and so good for our sport right like I mean I've known that forever about them but it was cool that like that's something that hasn't changed, right? They still love each other as much as they did when they were kids and like they're still best friends and are so happy to be in that position with each other. So yeah, I, I don't think I don't think much has changed over the years about their dedication. It's just that everything that they've laid down long ago is ca- finally coming to fruition and they're being able to um, have results and perform in a way that they've always hoped to. And it just shows that hard work pays off. I wanted to ask, this is like kind of just stupid question just for fun, but do you remember by any chance when you work with them, like, do you remember what weaknesses you used to have to focus on with them at all? Is that something that's still in your mind? Um, I feel like a long time ago, like Natalia definitely wasn't as good at coordination as she is now. Like her coordination has improved a lot. Um, Even, even like back in the day, steep walls, she wasn't as good on as she is now. Now, like, I mean, she can do anything. I and mean, when I go back to Boulder, I'll, I'll climb with them at Cats. And I remember Angie telling me one day, she's like, oh, this is so hard to keep up with them at Cats now. She's like, it's like really, really hard. I mean, even like a couple of years ago, it wasn't as hard to keep up with them at Cats. And then I went and I was like, oh my gosh, you are so right. Like, I, like yeah. there's moves that they'll do and I'm like oh wow I, I, I can't even come close to touching that and I'll right. just like walk it like no problem um and then with Brooke I would say I mean her finger strength has always been like out of this world and you notice she only climbs with three fingers mm-hmm. which is crazy to begin with like she never close hand crimped anything hmm. which actually even though she is so successful with the three hand open climbing it might actually be a good idea to start training 
the clothes hand cramp, just in case. It can, like know. it can only make, prepare you better for exactly, whatever comes next. Exactly. So maybe that's something that she should start working. Just like as a side note, that could be something. Yeah. Just add into her repertoire, but um, just saying, Brooke, also, if you want those silvers, you gotta you gotta start. Let's go. Start, <laughs> yeah, let's start closing that. <laughs> also, like for her, she's always been so much smaller, so I think you know she's always been pretty good at coordination and like jumping, but she has to always like work on it a bit more so that she can get to the height that other people have, and I think she's done a really good job of that. In the, over the past couple of years to where it's like, if they're going to set a jump, like she's going to be able to do it still, even though she's only five, two. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, they, yeah. So I guess those are a couple of things. Cool. They're just both so strong though. Very cool. <laughs> and, oh, you know what? Actually, um, I would say Brooke has worked on flexibility a lot too. Natalia started working on flexibility. I'd say like a couple of years before Brooke, like she would like openly be talking about all the time, how she, like she makes sure she stretches every day. Um, and you've, probably seen from both of them they're both very flexible but i know like brooke started doing that in the last like year and a half too like mm -hmm. really paying attention to stretching i mean the day i hung out with her at the comp she was stretching the whole time she was like doing her splits uh so i that's something they both have paid a lot of attention to hmm. cool that's good insight um it, it, it's interesting that the thing that i want to add to this is the fact that natalia you know dethroned yanya could be a headline in and of itself, right? Because Yanya, I don't know if people listening to this realize she had not lost a bouldering World Cup event that she had participated in since 2000. Vail, I think Vail 2018 um, was uh, Alex Puccio won it, and then and then since then it's been all all Yanya, and it will be very fascinating to see what happens now to Yanya on the bouldering circuit. And here's here's why I say that. I wrote this down, Tyler. And Megan, you can remember this too. In 2019, when Yanya lost to Cheyun So. Like let's let's sort of take a time travel back to the lead circuit, 2019, the lead World Cup circuit. So Yanya wins at Vilar to start off the season, the first event of the season. And I'm instantly then, like she's gonna streak all of it. She's gonna win the whole course. damn season. Of course, <laughs> because she had just swept the bouldering World Cup circuit, right? Uh, but then at Chamonix, the next World Cup, lead World Cup, Cheyun wins. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we were all of a sudden like, oh, okay, well, Yanya's been beat, but, you know, it's probably going to be status quo from here. But then Brian Son, Cheyun wins. Uh, Kron, Cheyun wins. And Yanya gets 13th. So Yanya like, just that, like, so you know, she doesn't and, make and, the final. That's right. Crazy. And then, <laughs> and then Jia Men, Cheyun wins again. And Yanya gets fourth, doesn't podium. And then at Inzai, the last one of the season, Jain Kim actually wins, and Yanya gets second. I think, if I remember correctly, I think Cheon got third, but I'm not positive. Um, so it was almost like Yanya losing that first one at Chamonix, sort of like, I don't know what you'd say, open the floodgates or whatever. Like, it's like, all of a sudden, the Yanya, it was, you know, Yanya was no longer this dominant force on the circuit. Now, how much of that was the fact that Cheon was so otherworldly good in 2019 and how much of that was maybe Yanya it, it did something mentally to her we you know who knows that's kind of that's up to everyone to speculate but the point is it will be very interesting now that Yanya has lost on the bouldering world cup circuit it will be interesting to see is it going to be a case of like that lead season where she you know now wins some but doesn't win all of them or will she kind of find her mojo again and go back to to starting a new streak <laughs> Who knows? And who knows how many of these she'll even participate in because she's got the, the Olympics and whatnot. But I just thought it was interesting to compare this sort of the what if to compare it to what happened in 2019 on the lead circuit. I also think I'm glad you brought up the Olympics because I also think it's really hard to tell in general, right? Because she has a different goal in mind overall and she has to train three disciplines right now. And I think being a single disciplined climber right now is to people's advantage. And I mean, even Brooke too, or um, Miho, like they're both also training for the Olympics. So the people that aren't training for the Olympics right now in a bouldering final, I think have an advantage of focusing on bouldering more aggressively than those other athletes can right now. And they're in a different part of their training cycle. So I feel like this year, I'm not sure we can even compare it to that 2019 lead year because there wasn't the same thing happening with what other athletes are preparing for right now. So 
I also, I mean, that being said, I do think I, for whatever reason, I think Anya is going to fight harder in bouldering competitions. I, to me, watching, she seemed a little off anyway, in general. She didn't seem like herself in that final semi. She felt more like herself, but still not, not, not her normal self. So I think that part of that probably has to do with, you know, where she is in her training cycle and what else she's preparing for. I know she's dedicating a lot of time to speed because that is a discipline discipline where she can improve the most, which she did in qualification with an 8.36. That was her lowest competition time she's ever put up. Then she kind of messed up in the final. So, yeah, I don't know if it's mm -hmm. as applicable in the same way as that other year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's it's almost it's 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 almost more impressive that Yanya can still place yeah. you know on a podium when when she is training for for you know a, a completely different training schedule, training for the Olympics, these three disciplines. Yeah, I don't mean to take anything away from but her. The one thing I'll certainly. say counter to that is like Brooke is in the same situation as Yanya Garmbret, and Brooke started from a much lower level of like bouldering uh like uh on the on the world cup circuit right like brooks not, like i would never have expected this year for brook rabbitu to be meddling in a bouldering event in my opinion so it's it's like both of those things are like playing against each other i'm not sure how to like deal with those two factors that, that's it. okay so but then the other thing that you've never seen from brook rabbitu is brook rabbitu not be going to school at the same time as she's doing all these competitions okay because like the previous um, when we, when they, when everyone thought 2020 was happening, she took off that semester of school in order to train for the Olympics. And she's currently off of school right now training for the Olympics. So all the other times you saw Brooke, I mean, and even when she qualified for the Olympics, she was also still a full-time student, yeah. um, which is impressive in and of itself. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're seeing an also, you're seeing an athlete that's qualified for the Olympics, who's taking training or like doing things in her training that she's never fully done before because what she'd been doing was working, but now it's the Olympics and now she has multiple coaches. She's has like a more of a scheduled training um, regimen going on. I don't know. I'd say Brooke is way more serious about climbing than she's ever been. So she's just a different That's athlete fair. all around. That's fair. Because before she was just so naturally talented. So yeah. all right. she was like, cool, what I'm doing is working. <laughs> yeah. But, John, John, let's move this along. What's sure. your what's your big winner? I feel like we've covered almost all of them. So you're you're really. Wait, I thought I was second. Are you the? Big winner. Or no, yeah, go for it. Man. You're third. You're third. Okay. I'm third. You're, you're, you're both, you're both. If, I'm if you've got one, if you've got a hot topic, Megan, you're welcome well, to go. As long as you don't take mine, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll say the big one that I wrote down, we've kind of already talked about it a little bit, but I think the big winner ends up being USA climbing. Um, Megan, was that your was that yours? Um, I honestly had already bailed on that one because uh, we already talked about Sean and Natalia. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to switch to something else. So take it away. <laughs> things that to, to sort of pile on top of, you know, Sean's historic win, Natalia's historic win, Brooks podium, all this stuff we've already talked about. On top of that, um, they hold an USA climbing in conjunction with the IFSC holds a, a pair, you know, back to back weekends of world cups in the spring or spring, summer, I guess. And, luckily has fantastic weather right the only time it rained it's an outdoor venue the only time it rains is a is a the first friday qualification uh literally every day i would wake up in my hotel i'd, I'd like go to my the blinds and i would like cross, i'd be like oh i hope it's nice weather and then i'd open the blinds and it was blue sky and i was like oh good you know i was so happy for usa climbing and for the athletes and for the fans every day that it was nice it was nice weather that matters at a comp like this an outdoor venue right um on top of that usa climbing gets the publicity of m multiple world records being broken in american soil at a at a, an event that they're sort of uh, doing in conjunction with the ifsc they get all the 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 three gold medals between Natalia's two and Sean Bailey's. Um, and then on top of that, we haven't even really talked about it, but they get new national records in speed climbing. Um, and, and, you know, tip of the hat to Emma Hunt and John Brosler. That's, that just, that just adds to it all. So I think the big winner coming out of this is, is USA climbing and, and both the organization and also just USA climbing sort of lowercase, right? Just in general climbing in the United States. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. It was a huge weekend for USA Climbing. Um, 
And I, it's funny, too, because that first weekend, the weather was maybe the best outdoor weather ever, right? Because it was, like, pretty cool. Like, I, I was shivering and had a jacket on when I was watching finals. But for the climbers, that was absolutely amazing. And luckily, like, the rain in Salt Lake isn't similar to that of Florida, where it'll, like, be sideways and super hard forever. It was, like, pretty chill, never affected the climbing. Don't have to have that hot slab like we used to in Vail. Like, as a venue, it was amazing. It was great. Yeah, and I know that when I say the weather was perfect, I know it was very, very hot. But I think in the long run, having just people in the crowd be be hot is better than have them getting drenched yeah. by rain. Because hot, I feel like you'll in, they'll endure the heat. If it's just a downpour, you know, people, people are going to leave. Gonna go home. They're not. Yeah. yeah they're, so. So I, true. I just want to bring up a bit of trivia. From what I've recorded, the last time a U.S. athlete won an IFSE speed medal was... Uh, if, if take a guess if you guys know it, but um, I actually don't know. <laughs> it says from my records, it's Hans Florine in 1997. Oh my gosh, stop! 97, <laughs> you said? Wow, yeah. that might be true on the adult side. Yeah, sure. sorry, That's not we I. Really care about, I, right? I ignore youth yeah. comps because it's all garbage. Yeah, I do too. Usually, anyway. yeah. I mean, youth comps are great. It's great in reference yeah, to it's just not the first same. adult circuit, but yeah. yeah, it's not the same. It's age groups. It can't. Wow. Be so that was, uh, you know, what twenty? Like twenty four years you know, ago. Twenty four years yeah, ago. That's, that's wild. incredible. Yeah. yeah. And and what's wild about that too is that like someone like John Brosler has had fast times for mm -hmm. a really long time and could be competitive, but prior to this competition, I think his best placement was eighth. Mm -hmm. You know, so like he's been in a final, he just hasn't been able to like put it together. So even though he missed the podium spot, fourth is still an amazing result for him. He had a great run and and just a bunch of exciting races. Wow. Um, yeah, it would not. Yeah, it was fourth place, but that almost doesn't do justice to just how great his weekend was. Yeah, or his, his day, I guess. But yeah. yeah, exactly. And then Emma too, like and yeah. and like you said, John, two more national records. Like that's that's exactly what should be happening. So it's nice to see it actually happening. <laughs> yeah, I almost I heard people talking in the audience about how. This was really interesting because Tyler, we've been talking on these debriefs, debriefs about how there are s these certain teams, particularly Japan and Slovenia, that just keep flexing their depth at all of these competitions. And every other national, uh, every other country is just kind of playing catch up with the depth of Slovenia and Japan. And I think this was uh, very clearly this this weekend and last weekend too. The the U.S kind of sh showed some of that depth as well, right alongside Japan and Slovenia. Now, whether or not it'll be consistent in the coming World Cups is, is a big question, but um, but I, I think it, it, this just goes back to what I was saying about USA Climbing having such a great weekend. Yeah, maybe like I yeah. mean, if we start sending Americans consistently to every World Cup, then I think we could actually start talking about that. I think that's the part that's always held you guys back for a lot of these disciplines is like, we have no idea because they're just not there, so... Yeah, and I, that's a huge change too, right? Because now there's like funding for the athletes to do that. Angie and I were talking about that the other day too. Most ever World Cups we ever did in a season was four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that, that's just not enough to get the experience that you need to be able to make it happen. And there were athletes like Alex Puccio and Alex Johnson who did full circuits a couple times, but they had to do that all by themselves. Yeah. Like that was the time period where you didn't even have a physio over there. We were all just running to Klaus from the Austrian team being like, can you please work on me? I'm in so much pain. <laughs> so. And, yeah. And it's really hard to grow comp climbing if that's the case, right? If you, yeah. if you're not sort of investing in the full in the in the team and the fact that usa climbing is doing that now is fantastic so yeah and this is now like a couple years of having athletes like more than one or two athletes actually go and do the whole circuit right now it's becoming more of the trend where it's like you, you make the team and you're committed to the full circuit which is cool to see yeah. that happen i mean even even just to talk about the fact that like we hadn't had two men and two women in finals since 2009 and, and like, this is Zach Gallas' first World Cup of the season, and he makes finals. He's, I think, hadn't even made a semis before that. Like, I think this was his first semis, too. I could be wrong. I, so many facts. I can't remember. Get them all straight anymore. But, um, I mean, that's huge. So, like, you're talking about that depth that's finally, like, being created. It's something that has never really been there before. It's been, okay, we have one or two athletes that are going to perform well. But now it's like, oh, we've got, like, six or seven or ten athletes that could perform well at any given day. Or on every any given yeah. day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so Megan, I want to hear what what your uh, big winner is from uh, from this weekend. 
My big winner is Miho Nanaka. Hell yeah. And she's my big winner <laughs> from this weekend and we're adding in last weekend as well. Totally. Because as an Olympic qualified athlete, she must be psyched to have made the final both weekends, both weekends in bouldering, and then not just make the final in speed, but also podium in third place. Because I mean, I'm pretty sure that's the first time anyone who hasn't been a speed specialist for 10 years has ever podiumed in an event. That was absolutely yeah. insane. And it was so much fun to watch her because she, every time she got into the next round, she was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. And I asked her the last day, she was like, I, I was just so excited. I didn't know what was happening. It was wild. So it was so cool to see that. And though like this past weekend's finals was not a great final for her. She was still in the final and she still topped boulders and she was fourth the weekend before and had a much better round. Still like not her best round, but a good round nonetheless. And just that consistency, more and more consistency that she can have, that's incredible. So I thought, I thought she was a, a big winner from the weekend. It's, it's, you, we can't really understate how this does not happen where somebody from outside speed climbing wins. Like you, you do have to go back before you find people who would like, you know, win a speed, win a lead, although it might be like seven years apart, or there were a couple men, um, uh, that, uh, that had done it in the past, including one that has done it on the same weekend, winning a bouldering and a speed. Um, but it's just like, it's, it's not a thing that's done. And I'm not so optimistic to say it's something that's going to happen a lot in the future. I think if you got to watch that, it is kind of a bit historical. And like you said, her faces were the best part of watching the speed. It was so unusual to see somebody over and over after multiple climbs. Like she wasn't, it, the look on her face wasn't celebratory. It was just like how, is this happening? This is the funniest yeah. thing that's ever happened to me. Like, it's ridiculous for me to be in a speed, like, you know, semifinal, like a uh, small final and stuff. It was, it was wild. I, it, it totally ruined my podium projection for the women's speed <laughs> event, but, uh, but it was just as cool. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't give it up for the world. So yeah, big, uh, big deal. Yeah. I don't have much to add. She was listed. I listed her as, as one of sort of the the honorable mentions or whatever for winners also i she's she's so fun to watch because she is one of those competitors that so is is fairly expressive um when she climbs and when she's kind of you know sitting on the mats thinking about the beta and everything and and that was just like turned up to 11 on the speed like you said like every it was just the expression on her face i would encourage anybody to go look at the instagram her instagram and the instagram of a number of the photographers that were there because they captured it perfectly that that look of just she she was we were surprised and she was clearly surprised that she was uh you know doing so well in the speed heats yeah and she got a new personal best too with a run at eight too mm -hmm. i mean she was always of the athletes that had to start focusing on speed. She was faster earlier on than basically everyone else. But I mean, I know Kyra's put up a faster time than that now, but it, it's still really cool to see like low eights for the women that have just had to start learning speed over the last couple of years. It's so impressive. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. All right. Let's, uh, let's go to our big losers for, for the weekend. Oh. Always the most fun part. And of course we're making Megan go first. So. so you already touched it on this a little bit, but I feel like the big losers are all the athletes that found themselves planning on competing this past weekend and then having to go home due to some sort of tweak or serious injury. So Adam with his shoulder, um, which he, he made it sound like isn't that bad, but didn't want to risk it because he felt like it hurt on specific moves. Um, Jesse with her finger, that is absolutely devastating. Also wild to know that it happened on the second boulder during finals the first weekend because I definitely did not see that. Ha like, I didn't catch it. Um, I keep meaning to watch back to see if I can find it. So I haven't yet, that, but yeah. I didn't notice a thing while we were, yeah, yeah. in the... And she states too, I mean, the other boulders were open hands, so she was able to get on them, but it is wild um, and super devastating that that happened. And then Julia Sharno D not even getting to compete because she tweaked her shoulder before competing in a, like during a training session. So for these Olympic qualified athletes, I think it's just really devastating. And I mean, I just hope they all heal up quickly. Um, and yeah, Miho had ice on her shoulder, probably like more of a preventative thing. Um, cause she had a shoulder injury not too long ago, like a few years, like a year or two ago. So I feel like everyone's having to be so much more careful, um, because the Olympics are coming up and they've been putting their body through so much over the past few years. And like Shauna 
too. I mean, like you said earlier, she was planning on going home, but she's dealing with, you know, her own thing with her back right now. So, yeah, I would say the injuries. Who um, all about who do you guys think, like, really, uh, of this of these kind of injuries that have come up, who do you think is – sorry, I'm, I, I, I don't have this question prepared in my head, but, like – which one is the worst? Which one is, is the scariest or is the most intimidating before the Olympics or like, what's the most serious? I'm like, wh- however you want to put it, but which one are you like, damn, that sucks. I would say Shauna's back or Jesse's finger. Mm-hmm. Seemed like I would, most difficult to me. Yeah. I would say certainly um, in terms of the, I don't know what you'd say, like the medical severity. Uh, I th- would think a back injury or a pulley would be the worst. Now, it's and we're all we're all at... doctors here, so we're we can give <laughs> a professional. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to look at it from a publicity standpoint, though, because for the Olymp the IOC, the Olympics, the, the, their the worst thing is probably Adam Andra potentially being injured in the sense mm-hmm. that he's the big name, right? He's like. The, one of the big names, one of the big superstars that everybody knows that everybody will be tuning into the Olympics to watch him compete. Now, like Megan said, his injury doesn't sound, you know, that bad. And we hope and it's not, his withdrawal but, also was kind of like pre like preemptive. Like it seemed like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But I really think it's almost just kind of like, well, it depends on how you want to look at the question in terms of which one is, is more, uh, is more severe. Uh, but, but I think to, to back to Megan's point too, I think one of the things that the the combined discipline, as much as everybody, it, t- it took everybody a while to warm up to it, and even some people still think it's kind of weird, and opinions are very divided on it. One thing that people kind of don't realize first and foremost is just how much more the combined discipline is, how harder it is on your body to train for that, right? Um, it's you're, you know, like literally, you're training for three disciplines instead of one. That's just three times as much um, sort of rigor on, on your, your joints, your tendons, your muscles, all that. So I just think that that needs to be underlined, what Megan said. That was a great point. My biggest loser is Tomoe and Arasaki. And mm. that's for, and I need, I need some help, like trying to, trying to figure this out. Cause my understanding, like I, I saw his first run, he false started. Mm-hmm. Um, what happened on his second run or did he not get a second run? Does that you put don't you... get a second run when yeah. you fall start. You fall start in your first qualifier You're and you done. don't get. Which is a controversy. Mm. You know, a lot of people don't like that, that. But I will say that is how it works in like Olympic sprinting, for example, yeah. like the, you know, running events and stuff. It's it's one and you're done. So um, as much as people might not like, might think that's really severe. And it, and it certainly is that. It is. It does have parallels in other sports. Well, and like track and field has gone back multiple times, like switching that rule, right? Because they're always trying to figure out if it makes the most sense. But from my understanding, the idea for having one false start, make, putting you out of the competition, is so that people don't abuse the false start, right? So they're not false starting on purpose to mess with their competition's head or whatnot. Because I guess it's happened in the past. So in in both sports, so um, it's better to make it a serious deal to avoid people from false starting. What I think is kind of a bummer about false starts is that oftentimes the athletes, when they do false start, they are so close to the right reaction time. I don't remember what Tomoa's was, but um, one of the other athletes that did false start in the final, I remember it was like 0.096, which is like so close to the 0.100, which is the lowest reaction you can have. So that is kind of, a bummer and and it's not ideal but it's like what do you do you just have to really make sure you're focused on not full starting <laughs> yeah well, yeah, well this, uh, the silver lining for Tomoa I'll just say this quickly Tyler is that you know he still was in the bouldering he got to participate in the bowl I mean think about if you know that's a long plane flight from Japan yeah. right imagine <laughs> you came all the way 14 hours or whatever it is to, and you were only in the speed the speed event and you fall start and it's done like especially traveling in the the COVID era and all that that would have just been awful. So yeah. the silver lining is that he still got to compete in, in bouldering. Certainly. Man, I don't, I don't know if I like it's, it's the narrowest of silver linings. Cause so f- the reason I brought him up for speed is because I think he's the one that everybody wants to know how fast he is because yeah. he's kind of been this figurehead of a non speed climber taking huge initiative to innovate and 
turn it into something he's a master of. Like he's kind of the guy that everybody's a bit worried about. Like, you know, if there's a boulder or a lead climber, that's going to be a killer speed climber. It's probably Tomoa. Mm -hmm. And we kind of, we really wanted to see that. And, you know, if, if you had to tell me that a non-speed climber was going to meddle at this speed event, Tomoa would have been my guess. It wouldn't have been me. Totally. Right. Um, uh, So, so that was really disappointing, but I mean, his performance in the boulder round was also pretty disappointing for him too, because could you ask for a more Tomoa set of boulders? Seriously, it was shocking, right? It was the idea that Bailey had it won from his first climb on that particular set of boulders is nuts to me. So I I don't know if Tomoa went away with any sense of happiness after uh, after that weekend. So I mean, had he not topped the last boulder in finals, I think he would have been really upset. But he seemed, I mean, it just seemed like when he topped that last boulder that he was pretty psyched. Sure. Yeah, but, I, but, like, I, but he's like he's the, he's the best boulder there, right? Like no, he's yeah. the guy. So it was it was a free win and in very Tomoa fashion. Well, shouldn't say that because I don't think he was not trying or making goofy mistakes or whatever. But like that that was his to win. And uh, yeah, I actually was really interested by his climbing specifically. Like oh, yeah? um, when he came out for the paddle boulder, mm-hmm. his first attempt was really interesting because he fully skipped the second right. hole. Yes. Which I thought was actually clever because finals is really the time you can pay attention to the crowd, right? And figure out, oh, are people doing this? Or are they not doing this? Yeah. And I mean, only I think it was pretty obvious to tell that only two people had done it. So I think it gave him like the wiggle room to try something kind of crazy on his first attempt. That I mean, it seemed like it could have been, I mean, it, it could have been something that he could have made work too. But I feel like that might have been part of his thought process, you know, thinking, oh, I'm not sure this is going to work, but this is an opportunity to try and see Mm -hmm. when I know not as many people have done this boulder, maybe. True. Yeah. It it was funny listening to the crowd when he tried that attempt, tried skipping that, that, that middle, you know, that middle paddle and the crowd was just like, Whoa, like nobody was expecting him to try (laughs) that. And he came really, really close. He looked close, right? He He did. I was, yeah, I was surprised. I don't think, if I remember correctly, I don't think he tried it again. I think it was just that first attempt. But he was close enough that I was kind of surprised he didn't he didn't stick with that beta. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, too, because he was close quite a few times anyway, right? Holding that middle one or even kind of throwing his... Well, he never really tried to throw his foot, and I think that that was surprising, right? Because he had enough speed. He was mm-hmm. moving so fast, and he never really, on the times he was going for all three threw that foot out enough in order to, you know, make that happen. But yeah, I also, I heard so many rumors about him being able to run like a mid five speed run. Uh, So having him false start was definitely a bummer not to get to see that. And I mean, he created the Tomoa skip, right? Mm. So everyone's doing his beta. Yeah. 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 Uh, John. Yeah, oh, well, I'll, I'll say, while we're talking about the route setting, I think this is not my my loser, but I think some people might be surprised that we don't mention the route setting a little bit, particularly the men's route setting, in the loser category, because I know that, I, I think we can all agree, the men's final was was pretty overcooked it was uh, a no snoozer top. man sucked having to watch it like it wasn't it wasn't that fun like i, I it was funny because we were we were talking about um you know we there was a bunch of us in the discord that were just chatting through the event and um we were just talking about you know what it means to be a commentator and how how <laughs> like what's the longest you have to go where there's nothing to talk about and it, it was like that kind of situation for you guys where it was like two problems straight and most of the other two problems as well of just like emptiness it was just talking about like what might happen but there was just nothing there like what a it, it was a brutal round uh, it's funny though because yeah with root setting specifically it ended up being a brutal round right in terms of there not being a lot of tops and people struggling like mm-hmm. their whole time through the final but on a different day all those boulders could have been sent is the problem right sure, it's yeah. like it's so hard to guess and honestly what's this, about, this is what's why it happen. sucks talking about root setting because there are so many factors and like it's yeah. pretty rare that i'm gonna actually call out a root setter and say they did a bad job right like that's <laughs> That's extremely rare to isolate all the other factors and say, no, it was the root setters that messed up. That's crazy hard to do. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's unreasonable to say the boulders didn't work today. 
right? Like that's, yeah. you know, that's totally fair. And it shouldn't be seen as a slight against the root setters. Although somebody will always say that we're just <laughs> like, a fi- like, don't you know, these guys are the best in the business or whatever. Like, yeah, I, I completely understand that, but it didn't work today. So it also, I, I do also want to go back to the fact that I think if Sean had one more minute on both two and three, he could have done the boulders. Like he, he was mm-hmm. pretty close. He so, knew how long he had. He knows how long four minutes is. Like, but no, yeah, you I, know, I, I know what you I'm mean. Just saying, though, it's, it's funny <laughs> because, because like, it could have still happened, maybe. Totally. You know, like, yeah. and they're all capable. Um, and it is again, it's just hard to it's hard to guess. Like, at, even though root setters obviously know what they're doing, they have so much experience. They're yeah. still guessing. I think men's um, men's two is like that. That kind of like. Yeah, that was such a great problem for illustrating like how narrow the margin is between everybody succeeding and everybody yeah. failing, right? Like that Especially just, that move specifically, that just, jump move. Exactly. Just a dead point to an accurate razor crimp. The hold wasn't that. that you will f- likely have to catch one hand. Totally. Right? And yeah. not come mm-hmm. with the other. That was such an like a good illustration of how hard it is to set for these athletes. Because like a little bit down and everybody gets mm-hmm. it. Like exactly. so yeah, it's a good example, but it didn't work. So And did it wasn't it Tamoa that kept trying to flip on the uh He was going into hand? a push kind of, yeah. Yeah, which which also could have possibly worked at some point. Mm-hmm. Like a really good adjustment to trying to figure out how to create some opposition yeah. so yeah sorry john we john we completely hijacked your, your no no <laughs> this is great because I, I this is all i i i agree with all of what you both said and i will just add that the only reason i'm not mentioning the route setting as a in the loser category is because it kind of circles back to my my headline i think it made sean bailey's uh top of men's four all the more special and all the more dramatic because the, the crowd had been sitting there for, you know, <laughs> what, like, you know, 12 attempts of on 12 separate, like without any, without any tops. It's just like every time a competitor came out and got, got just, you know, bested by the boulder, it just, it, the, the anticipation and the, and, and the eagerness for somebody to actually top was, was just greater and greater. And then the fact that it was finally Sean Bailey who, who <laughs> sort of broke through and, and topped that boulder. I think that added to the the frenzy that the crowd, just the explosion of the crowd, because we were we were ready for a top by that point. To say I'll, the I'll, least. I'll add one comment. You don't have to comment on it, but I it depends on who you are as a spectator, because for me, I was an hour in to not seeing anybody top anything. I had a different browser window open when it happened. Right. Like <laughs> some people can like just hold on to the edge of their seat for an entire hour and like be psyched when it happens, but I missed it. I had to go back, right? Oh, well, it um, is also easier in person, right? To true, be yeah. engaged that right. whole time when people aren't top, topping. It's harder when you're not there. Yeah. yeah, and Tyler, you know, obviously you're in Canada. Here in the United States, maybe, you know, the the intrigue for Sean Bailey, obviously there might be some some sort of nationalism that plays into that, of course. Like, yeah, I totally I totally understand why that the, 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 that 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 my reason for why it ended up being fine might not be agreed, you know, shared with everybody, but, sure. but my, the big loser, I say this kind of uh, facetiously, I suppose, because again, I want to give props to, to all the people that made podium, certainly props to John Brosler and Emma Hunt, but my big loser is any country that's not Indonesia in regards to speed climbing, mm. because um, there's every country has a lot of, no pun intended, a lot of catching up to do um, <laughs> with speed climbing right now. The fact that the fact that the, the two Indonesians who who arrive in the United States, they each of them breaks the world record. And the fact that the speed final was between the two Indonesians. I mean, it just really uh, it just really makes you think, geez, these other countries like uh, good good luck, you know. And it was interesting because right after the event, I heard John Brosler he went up to um, the two Indonesians and he was, he was like, Hey, are you guys going to be trained in speed this weekend? Like after the finals <laughs> here? Because I want to train with you because it's really hard to find obviously like that caliber of, of speed climber here in the United States, which was really cool to, to hear Brosler kind of admit that, uh, you know, Hey, like I want to train with the Indonesians. <laughs> um, so uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know. That's just what I think. Any country, not Indonesia, um, you know, <laughs> well, and I also think it should be noted that um, one of the female Indonesian athletes held the women's world record for a time as well. So that's even further to um, even further to your point 
to state yeah. that Indonesia has quite the speed program in general, right? <laughs> Everyone else should be trying to copy them in some way. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, you know, this goes back to one of the winners that I that I didn't mention, but one of the, the category, one of the things I wrote down for the winner was just Indonesian climbing in general, because I talked to the the coach, Hendra Basir, the speed coach, after the um, after Kiramal broke the, the first world record. And I said, what's this going to do for Indonesian climbing? And he said, it's going to be it's going to be huge. He said it's like 3 a.m. in Indonesia when when the world record was broken. But he said when everybody wakes up, it's going to be all over the news. You know, kids are going to want to speed climb. The <laughs> kids are going to want to go to the climbing gym. That is great because that is that is what we want, right? Is this the the positivity of climbing to spread to whether new countries, new communities, new fans, new participants. That's the ideal, right? Yeah. And and he basically said this is going to happen in Indonesia uh, because of this because of these world records. So um, that's I feel like that's worth pointing out. True, hundred percent. I the the one thing that that was a bit disappointing for me was how few male speed legends there were at this event, which made it really hard to understand the impact of how fast these guys were going. Like, I think it was mm -hmm. just Martin Zienski and Ludovico Fasali, who were the only two previous uh, speed roll cup winners. And they've like medaled multiple times. Um, but I, you know, if, if the field had been deeper, I think the results still would have been the same because I can't imagine Basa Mawem or, you know, you know, who pick, pick whoever is hot right now. I can't imagine them hitting that time. Like the idea of a time below Reza's really yeah. ahead of its time record from 2017 is unreal to me. And so I hope they're both going to be at the next speed world cup where we can actually see them compete against the full field and then really be just, you know, jaws agape at just how, mm -hmm. like how revolutionary this is. Yeah, I wonder, and I wonder what Reza is is thinking about this, right? I mean, his record is pretty old by speed stand, 2017, right? I don't know if he has any interest or if he wants to do the World Cup speed circuit or or whatever, but it'd be interesting if he's in top shape. I don't I don't know how his speed conditioning is right now, but it'd be sure be interesting to get Reza against uh you know against the those two Indonesians. To that'd be mm -hmm. that'd be a nice little uh small final, big final, whatever you want to say. So. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I don't know much about Reza's life or whatever, but it, it seeing his form since then, it does make it look like that was really the run of his life back mm -hmm. in China 2017, right? Whereas with these guys going below that time multiple times in a single event where it didn't look like a surprise to them. Like, you know, the fact that they, they had an interview before the event saying, hello, we're from Indonesia. You've barely seen us before. We're here to break the world record. That's fucking yeah. crazy to say that, man. But they, yeah. they were like, yeah, we're, we know we're doing this, which is not the case for Reza's run back a couple of years ago. So mm -hmm. I think it does feel like it's on a different level. Um, that was awesome. There's a couple of things I want to uh, bring up because we didn't really talk. So first of all, here's a really good sign. I don't think we talked about the broadcast once in this entire conversation. So that's, that's a good thing that, awesome. you know, that yeah. I don't have anything to nitpick about. I wanted to bring up a couple of things that were really cool. And I had some, uh, some questions and opinions about them. So first one was this weather graphic that they're showing at the start of the rounds is mm. such a great addition yeah. to the broadcast. Like just not having to wonder what the actual, you know, temperature is. I, I would love to see um, some comment about like how much cloud cover there is or whatever, mm. but this is a great addition that I'm, I'm extremely happy about that. The other one is uh, this came up in semifinals after Sean McCall's um, attempt on, I think this was what, men's uh, one? I think was it was it? men's one, yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, very sketchy top. The judges yeah. gave it to him. It was instantly <laughs> appealed. Up here at the top, you can see there's a little bar saying that the call was... Uh, he has to go again. Kind of a kind of a weird way to phrase it. New try yeah. for Sean McCall, <laughs> but very cool that they're adding that. I still want Graham Alderson to have to walk out in a referee shirt with a microphone <laughs> and like you know make the call to everybody just I to make it clear. That. that would be so good, right? Um, this other one from uh, semifinals again. Uh, Kokoro Fuji mm. uh, explaining. You know he was the last one out, yeah. so it's much easier at this point. It's hard to do this for every athlete, but that added some great context, saying that he will qualify to finals if he does. 
this in less than seven tries. And then lastly, um, and I, I have opinion questions about this one, is the biographic. Um, mm. So little Justin Bieber, Sean Bailey here, uh, look alike. Uh, one, one of my friends was texting me being like, he is a spinning image. Yeah. Um, so what, what I wanted to talk about, first of all, this is a great thing to add. I like this a lot. But mm -hmm. the, the two, well, the three actually that confuse me are the stat on their tops percentage, mm -hmm. their participations number, and then the yeah. number of medals that they've won. So yeah, like, I agree with that too. So, I think yeah, it's <laughs> the, the first point to bring up is that this is clearly showing a combination of results from World Cups, World Championships, but also Youth World Championships and also Continental events. Yeah. Because Sean, until today, until that day, had never won a gold before, except in like, was it the 2017 Pan American? youth championships or something like that so, or maybe yeah, not youth right. but um but, i think uh, it might not have been youth. yeah no he's too old for that he's too old for that yeah sorry. it was a pan am for sure um yeah, yeah it was oh no you're right it was pan american youth yeah it was youth, 2014, really? oh, 2014 okay that makes more bouldering. sense yeah right. i agree because when i saw that graphic too i was like skirt like what gold <laughs> did he win i remember thinking that's not right yeah. um and quickly researching and looking like oh okay that's why because it's not a world cup yeah, yeah i feel like the medals should be specific to world cups or i mean i think world championships can fall in there as well but definitely only adult not youth because then it's kind of confusing it's like wait what? well it's, it's also i from what i understand it's also for any discipline as well yeah, it should. But I think it should be specific to the discipline yeah, too, that's, that that's, we're watching, right? Yeah, and like for the context of this event, where it's Sean Bailey comes out, the only context I want to know is he's never won this Boulder World, World Cup before. Cup. It is like if you're gonna tell me, like, let's say it's mm -hmm. a lead specialist, like you know, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't even know who to pick, but like Jane Kim, for example. I would love the context of Jane Kim as a lead climbing legend, but bouldering yeah. has only ever like won one or however many it is. Yeah. That's interesting, though, but you have to separate it, right? Like it's, yeah. the context is so different. Even the participations I think should be separated just to yes. like, we can keep world cup and world championship in the same participation. Sure. But I mean, if you look at the stats, it would come up, you know, whatever continental you've been to, also, like the former UIAA stuff, if you're old enough to have done those, that would count as your participation number. Mm -hmm. Like for someone like Akio, that mm -hmm. would be in her participation number. Has oh, she reached really four relevant. digits of, of <laughs> four digits of participation yet? Is she just in the <laughs> thousands? Where, like, no. right. But yeah, like or Oriane is another great example where like this is her third, you know, World Cup, yeah. right? Not whatever it says. It's like, I don't know, like eight or 10 or I'm not sure what well, youth events. And I think the tops, the part, like the percentage of tops is in reference to just World Cups, as same as like, because I have access to the stats and like it'll show people's like semifinal percentage. And for someone like Orion and Mejdi, it's 100% because they've only done three World Cups mm -hmm. and they made semis in all three of them, which is so impressive. Right. But but then it's like Adam Mondras is also 100%, which like, I mean, he's done so many World Cups. So for his semi to be 100%, that's really right. cool. Um, well, and, and it's specific to, um, the discipline as well. So right. I, I agree though, it should stay, that graphic should stay more specific. And I, I would like to, you know, um, it, it is a, like the, the percentage of tops I think does need to clearly specify what it's referring to, um, in regards to what you just mentioned, which is like, you know, um, what events exactly count towards this? Mm -hmm. Is it just World Cups or is it other things? But also if it's including rounds that you didn't climb in, like does that include mm -hmm. semifinals or finals to which you didn't qualify? Um, because that can work in both ways, right? Like if I, like John, let's say you get, let's say you flash, sorry, this is going to be a terrible example. John, let's say you get four <laughs> tops and qualifiers and you flash them all. I also get four tops and qualifiers, but it took me some extra attempts. And let's say the dividing line was between us. You go through to semis and I just mm -hmm. stopped at qualifiers because you then have to climb four more problems. Let's say you top none of them. That stat's going to imply that you topped a smaller yeah. percentage than I did, yeah. which isn't necessarily like every stat has weaknesses and strengths. So I understand, mm -hmm. but I do need to know what, what that statistic is really saying. So that's, that's basically the entire the length of, of stuff I have to say about the, I was ex really excited to see all these graphics, every world cup, mm -hmm. there's like a new one that gets added and I'm excited every time. So yeah, it's, it, it's actually been a really great viewing experience well, so far. What was your thought about the graphic tracking them 
um, through the bouldering round underneath their name, where oh, it was like, I did that it? make sense to you? I, I hate it so much. <laughs> it's funny because somebody, one of my friends texted me about the graphic and I honestly hadn't even noticed the graphic because mm-hmm. I'm so focused on the climbing that I hadn't noticed it. So the second time around, I yeah. did pay attention to it and it made sense to me. But... So I, I noticed that Pete was kind of ex- taking time to explain it mm-hmm. more in the second World Cup, which I don't remember him talking about in the first, although I may just have missed it. But there's a there's a bunch of things that are weird. One of them is that number that's overlaid on the climber's nationality, which I think is their bib number or their their like what would have been their bib number, their order of coming out in qualifiers which isn't relevant given that their names are now on their bibs instead of their qualification (laughs) number. number. The second thing is the rank number. What rank is that referring to? Is that the rank from the previous round? Is that your world ranking? Is that your season ranking? Like there's all these things that we have. I don't don't know what that number means. Yeah. And then the rectangles, I've already had a screed about this where this like, it's ridiculous that we're pretending that, um, that bouldering scoring ends at tops and zones. Like that's just a lie. And if you yeah. or I want to try and predict, okay, who needs to do what to, to win this event in the last problem, it, it doesn't stop at tops or zones. If you're a fan mm-hmm. of this, you need the last two pieces. So like yeah. that has so to be. So you have to keep track on the app as well. Yeah, you have to. And I, I don't, you. I don't mind having an app as an augment to my experience mm-hmm. or whatever, but I, I, I still argue that it's, it's simply not complete until you have zones and, uh, so so would, to you, would you prefer to see T four Z eight? I mean, that doesn't make sense. Sorry, T four. I, I know what you mean. You want to see like Z2, all the numbers, right? Or that also doesn't make sense. Sorry. Well, T two Z one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> examples of like, Math, wait a minute. I was gonna say Math, actually making sense. Math never works on camera. Never uh, do math on camera. But you know what I mean. Would you rather? Okay, but I'm gonna do one that makes sense. T three Z four attempts to T <laughs> five attempts to zone eight or something. I don't know. Would, would that make sense to you seeing that better? Uh, kind of like I, I want that information, but I want it integrated in the rectangles yeah. where I, well, I think, yeah, I okay. want the top part of the rectangle to have the number of attempts to the top. I, think and I want the bottom easy. part. Yeah. I don't think it's that like, I mean, I understand you have to redesign your scoring thing, but I think it is just simply better. In Cause my I opinion. think, we with the ESPN shows were using that other method I was telling you about, mm-hmm. and uh, the joke is that like someone who doesn't know climbing, it looks like a Bitly code. It's like, yeah. the, what is that? Yeah. Like a yeah. climber, climber, a climber can understand it, but it does take a second, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, if you're not a non-climber, you're like, what are those numbers? That they like they don't even know what a top or a zone mm-hmm. is. So yeah. yeah, I agree. Like using the boxes and then just adding attempts on top um, of yeah, I guess I don't know exactly and where you would put the, but... the, the one other point I'll just mention is that I don't think you need that lower third score graphic for an individual, because even if I know what their individual score is, it means nothing if I don't also know the scores of everybody else. So Timo is climbing men's number three. It shows me his score. Don't know if he's ahead or behind yeah. or whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it takes for him to lose or to win. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm i still adamant that you need the full scores in the sidebar on the screen 100% of the time. Uh, that's the only way to actually understand what's going on. And I don't know why like why that's being pussyfooted around. It's like, are they waiting for the root setters to have some revelation that makes it so attempts like never matter and just like everybody's hmm. always separated by tops and zones? Because uh, that be seems to be what they're doing or they're <laughs> saying, or it should say on the screen all the time saying for full results, download this app. Like mm. do like a little link there. Yeah, it's just little, it's kind of it's just pretending that the score code. is less complex. <laughs> yeah. Totally, yeah. But it's just like it's it's faking it. It's like it's just a yeah. lie that that's enough to know anything. And I feel like that addition of the lower third was supposed to then like talk about attempts. But you're right. It's like it's not like you can. Then you're gonna have to like write down and keep track mm-hmm. of who had what attempts. So then to compare them to the other person. Yeah. If you wanted to keep track by yourself. So that would be kind of tricky, yeah. but there's, interesting. There's, there's two other things I want to mention. One really quick is that the, uh, the speed event operated with three decimal places. But when you go to the IFSC website, half of the pages show three decimal places and half of them show two, which is ridiculous. I don't know why we need three decimals in qualifiers, but not in finals. 
so they somebody did, fix are, that please you, are you talking about old events tyler because no I i'm know... talking about the current one like i know okay. way back they only did two and more recently they've switched to three but now for okay. this single event you will see both formats used depending on which round you're looking at so that mm-hmm. needs to be fixed because right now the world record is 5.20 which yeah. is like give me a little bit more like i know you guys know the last number like stop stop baiting me like i know there's i know there's a third decimal there um wait but the, you know the third decimal though right yeah, it's 5.28, oh. but it doesn't yeah. say that on the website. Okay, okay. Like, if you want to find out what the world record is, it just says, mm-hmm. oh, it's 5.20. But gotcha. like, that's not what we saw on the stream, mm-hmm. and it's not what the publication... Anyway, uh, uh, other thing was there was no live chat this weekend, uh, as opposed to uh, last weekend. I shot an email to communication set, and he actually just got back to us. Um, basically, what it sounds like is they are still trying to make the stream happen. Um, but in the last couple uh, uses of it, there, I guess there's there's an IFSC employee who's located just in the you know the European time zones where moderating it or keeping an eye on it was mm. way easier for her. Um, gotcha. But now that it's in the states, it's just not feasible. Um, mm. So they turned it off just because even though they did create moderators last weekend, like kind of at the last minute, and it worked. It is still weird to just like I said, deputize random people. Uh, but yeah. it looks like they are still trying to make it happen. I was worried that after some of the chats last weekend, they just gave up on it permanently, but it looks like they're still. Uh, so you like the live chat? I do. It needs a moderator because the internet mm-hmm. is like inherently terrible, right? So you just, you, all you need is a person. Like, first of all, the step one is enable slow chat so people can't post twice in 10 seconds or whatever it is because nobody needs to do that. And third, you have a moderator that just looks for stuff and just deletes messages. It's not hard. Mm-hmm. Like there's people that do that for free. So mm-hmm. I, I think they're on their way to getting there. I'm ha- I'm so happy that they're still trying to make it happen because especially with younger viewers who have grown up with nonstop feedback, watching mm-hmm. streams and stuff, it live chats do build their own culture and help mm-hmm. amplify a fan base. And it is really important. So I'm glad they haven't given up on it yet. So that's something I props. did not know. Big props. <laughs> But yeah, uh, that might be that might be. Does anybody else have anything to add? Otherwise, we might be done. I, I had a couple other winners that we didn't mention. Just quick shout out. Okay. We don't need to go into into them. But um, I just want to say Stasha Gejo had a had a great um, weekend. You know, she's coming back from injury. It's been well documented. She's a kind of a fan favorite yeah. because she's been open about coming back from the knee and stuff like that. 11th in qualifiers, fifth in semis, and then fifth um, in the finals with three tops. You know, that's that's great. I think uh, it was cool to see her back in sort of top form. And then also Alex Waterhouse. Um, yeah! You know, he was just uh, kind of, in some ways, sort of stole the show uh, because he was so fun to watch, so expressive. Again, people that haven't seen, you know, go find the Instagram photos of him. Um, I mean, talk about people that just kind of wear their, you know, that are so he expressive so with their climbing. Psyched. It was awesome to see yeah, that. <laughs> it was really great. Um, he, he was having so much fun. Kind of like Miho seemed a little surprised that Miho was surprised in speed. Alex was kind of surprised in bouldering when he got to the top of some of the boulders. Um, it was really fun. Yeah, I mean, it was his first bouldering World Cup. So I think that it's always good to go in you know, with not too much of an expectation. So when you do start topping boulders, especially in a semis, because that's historically the most difficult round, it is so exciting. So it was cool to see him really like lean into that. And he is an expressive climber. So it was so fun to watch that. He's he's just like this, this funny thing in my head where, so my understanding is he's, he's going to school in the States. He, he graduated. He went to Dartmouth. So he, he was, he, um, competed at a bunch of the bouldering nationals for the years right. that he was at Dartmouth, but I think he's back in Sheffield now. Okay. So yeah, that's just the funny thing for me is it's like, he's a guy, I know his face and sometimes he just shows up in random places. He's like, you know, <laughs> he's at a block shop open. He's in a U.S. nationals and like everybody wants yeah. to talk about him because he's just a really funny guy. And yeah. it's just like, wow, that's, it's like, Oh, Alex Waterhouse is here. Amazing. It's going to be hilarious. Even though like until now he hasn't been like this international star caliber, but like, this is a really cool breakout. I don't know if it's something he'll be able to keep up, but him and Stasha are two sides of the same coin where mm-hmm. Alex just, you know, has at least shown, you know, incredible, like positive and just engaging reactions. Stasha is the sound and the fury. Like she is oh, yeah. just, she is, she's doing bat flips, just sending brushes like out of the stadium. Yeah. She's 
love it. They're both they add so much to to that part I mean, of uh, of the show. Even her version of excitement is still kind of serious, sure, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny too because I like it, I think she's one that it's easy to think that she's so intimidating, but she's actually like super nice and friendly, but she is so it's like business out there on the mats yeah. every time. Um but she's definitely really exciting to watch. Totally. All right. Well, Dynamic. <laughs> let's let's wrap it up here. We're at like almost an hour 50. So we'll call it. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks, as always, to the people that support this show on Patreon, especially to the G5. Thank you to your support uh, for such a long time. If you want to support us, go there to get stickers, ask questions, things like that. Of course, you can always join the Plastic Weekly Discord where you can watch World Cups with us, talk shit about what's going on in the stream or with the athletes. It's a lot of fun. I think we had, we had actually like five different countries in the wow. Discord chatting. It was, it was actually really cool. Um, the time zones kind of wrecked everybody. So some people had to come in and out, but it was awesome. Um, of course, make sure you like and subscribe. And if you have comments about, uh, let's say, how they're presenting statistics uh, with the athletes, we're talking about the top percentage, maybe leave a comment about what you think there. Otherwise, John, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. I'm so glad you got to go to a World Cup this year. I know it was kind of like up in the air. So big win for at least half of us. Uh, <laughs> and then Megan, it was great to have you back on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time. Of course. So happy to be here again. Yeah. And with that, we will see you guys in the next one. Until then, uh, stay safe. Don't injure your pulley. Don't injure your shoulder. Keep it all together. And we'll see you guys in the next one.